Hi, um, thanks for inviting me to this uh, virtual conference in Lumini. Love Marseille, I wish I was there, but I'm happy to do this. Um, I'm gonna give a talk on incoherence of free by free and surface by free groups. And this is all joint with Rob Kropowler and Stefano Vaducci. And I um, really learned a lot from working with them. I had a good time. All right. So um, the definition that we'll be working with today is um, that of coherence. So we say that a group is coherent if every finitely generated subgroup is finitely presented. So um, this definition applies to all the finitely generated subgroups. So it's um, hard in general to verify. Um, it is completely algebraic definition, but I wanna present sort of a geometric approach um, to try to understand when a group is coherent. And I think it's a very interesting question to take your favorite group and try to figure out if it's coherent or not. Um, so a lot of the groups that we first encounter are coherent. So for example, free groups, every finitely generated subgroup of a free group is free. Uh, surface groups are coherent. This is a medium level interesting problem. It's in um, Pate, wrote a ni nice exposition of this. Uh, you can think of the group as either being a Z plus Z, if it's a fundamental group of a torus. In that case, every subgroup is finitely generated. So um, that actually is a really um, nice property for that group. The, uh, and then for the hyperbolic groups, you can use a hyperbolic structure to show this. Three manifold groups, this is a more difficult problem. This was done by Scott. Also, Shailen had a proof of this, and there's a nice exposition in a Borbaki article by Stallings um, showed that they have a Scott core. So the uh, any finitely generated subgroup of a three-manifold group is actually uh, the fundamental group of a compact three-manifold, and that allows you to show that it's finitely presented. That was a really important result. And um, free bicyclic groups are um, also coherent. Again, uh, Fain and Handel were able to show that if you have a free bicyclic group and you have a finitely generated subgroup, then that finitely generated subgroup is actually of the same type. So all of these results on this page don't just show that these groups are coherent, they show that they describe the finitely generated subgroups. So it's really a, um, a very comprehensive type of result. So you really understand the group and you say, oh, not only do I understand this group, but all of their finitely generated subgroups are basically of the same type. So it's a very deep understanding of the group in these cases. Okay, so a coherent um, group has a property that it's finitely generated subgroups are algebraically well behaved, they're finitely presented. So if we wanna try to use some geometry to understand this problem, we wanna know what is the analog for a subgroup being geometrically well behaved. So um, that is a notion of quasi-convexity. So if I have a group G that's acting geometrically on a geodesic metric space X, then we say that a subgroup is K quasi-convex for that particular action. If every geodesic between the points of the orbit, so here I drew the points of the orbit as these little black dots, and this um, red line here is supposed to indicate a geodesic between points of the orbit in the space X. So it might not be in the orbit or right along the orbit, but it's uh, in a neighborhood of the orbit. So you can think of a neighborhood of the Cayley graph. And we say that it's a subgroup is quasi-convex if some K exists. So now I, I said for the action on X here, so this in general can depend on the space X and even on the Cayley graph. So, but for hyperbolic groups, it doesn't actually. So for hyperbolic groups, it is a quasi isometry invariant. If, if I act on um, a, a space, then the subgroup, a particular subgroup will be quasi conduct on the action of one space or the action of another space. All such spaces will be hyperbolic. And furthermore, if I have a quasi-convex subgroup of a hyperbolic group, then it's going to act co-compactly on the whole of its limit set, and that is actually going to be another um, hyperbolic metric space. So that implies that the quasi-convex subgroup of a hyperbolic group is itself hyperbolic, which is going to imply in particular that it's finitely presented. 
So if I want to understand hyperbolic groups and I have a quasi-convex subgroup, then I know automatically it's finitely presented. So that's not where the um, witnesses to incoherence are going to lie. Here's supposed to be a picture. Okay, yeah. So here I have a quasi-convex subgroup. So I tried to draw a little cartoon here of S3. So this group is acting on H3. And there's a quasi-convex subgroup. Perhaps you've seen pictures of these quasi fuchsian subgroups of um, hyperbolic three-manifold groups. So if I have um, a H, a subgroup of G, where G is hyperbolic, and H is quasi-convex, then the limit set of H is going to embed in the limit set of G. That's because, the again, the whole of the limit set, the group acts um, geometrically on that. So that's going to be a space, another space X for H. And so the boundary is going to be the, um, the boundary of the group. So if you have a quasi-convex subgroup, then the boundary of that subgroup embeds in the boundary of your whole group. And this example is just quasi fuchsian subgroups. Okay. All right, so locally quasi-convex, um, locally quasi-convex, that means that every finitely generated subgroup is quasi-convex, that's the definition. So if I have a locally quasi-convex hyperbolic group, then it is coherent because every finitely generated subgroup is quasi-convex, which implies it's hyperbolic, which implies it's finitely presented. So a lot of the groups that we love are actually locally quasi-convex. So in low dimensions, I'll start with low dimensions and go get higher. So for a surface group, a hyperbolic surface groups are locally quasi-convex. Because I have a take a surface subgroup, I can realize it upstairs as this, this convex core of the of the um, of the limit set here. And it's going to be a hyperbolic space. The group, this subgroup, this I tried to indicate this free subgroup here, work geometrically on the subset here. And um, so that's locally quasi-convex. That's what this LQC means. If I have a hyperbolic three manifold with totally geodesic boundary, that's also locally quasi-convex. That's a little bit hard to see. It follows from Alfors finiteness theorem. But because it has non-empty domain of discontinuity, that's what's important here. A closed hyperbolic three manifold is not actually locally quasi convex. However, it is coherent because remember by Scott, three manifold groups are coherent. So this group is very interesting. Um, it's right on the cusp. Uh, it is coherent, but not locally quasi convex. So um, that's because there's these fibers um, whose limit set is the whole S2. And so they can't be quasi convex because it's a surface group and the boundary of a surface group. Um, is a circle. So these are not locally quasi-convex, but coherent. And when we go one more dimension, so like a closed hyperbolic four manifold is conjectured that those are all not coherent. So those are all incoherent. So things get interesting right around dimensions three and four. Okay, so I mentioned a fiber, and here I have a picture. So this is a fiber, say hyperbolic three manifold. If I glue the top to the bottom by a pseudo and an off, this fiber will be normal. So its limit set will actually be the whole sphere at infinity. And so that can't possibly be quasi-convex because the boundary of this group, subgroup, which is a surface group, isn't the limit set of it in the, in the boundary of G. So this is a good way, dimension three, the only way for hyperbolic three manifolds to get um, non-quasi-convex uh, subgroups. But in general, it's a good way for us to start to look for witnesses to incoherence. So we say that a group fibers, a group fibers, if it emits a surjection to Z with finitely generated kernel. So this is just a group analog of fibering like a three manifold fibers. And Stallings proved famously that if a three manifold group fibers as a group, if this is a three manifold group as a surjection to Z with finitely generated kernel, then the three manifold actually fibers and that that kernel is a fundamental group of a surface. So this is a good just way to look for incoherence because these are not quasi-convex. Okay, let's see. Okay. So in particular, so if uh, um, if I have a short exact sequence like this, 
where uh, the Euler characteristic of the quotient, which here is Z, and the Euler characteristic of the kernel, which here is K, are defined. And the, then the Euler characteristic of G is the product of the Euler characteristic of Z and K. This result is in brown. Um, so I can use this. So that means that if I know if this is Z, then that Euler characteristic is zero because the Euler characteristic is just the Euler characteristic of a K pi one for the group and the Euler characteristic, a K pi one for Z is just a circle. So I can, I know this is zero. So we can use this. If we know that the Euler characteristic for K is defined, so if we know it's a finite type, for example, then we can use this to get some um, witnesses to incoherence. So let me try to explain that. So Barry proved that if G has cohomological dimension less than two, and then if I have a um, normal subgroup, which is finitely presented, then N is finite index or free. Okay, so that means, so I say, okay, suppose this group of cohomological dimension less than two surjects Z with finitely generated kernel. I say, oh, well, what if it was finitely presented? Then that would mean it'd either be finite index or free. In particular, I could define the Euler characteristic, so that would mean the Euler characteristic of G would have to be zero. But if so, if I have a cohomological dimension group that's less than or equal to two, that surjects Z with finitely generated kernel, where the Euler characteristic is not zero, then I know that G must be incoherent. This is a good way to find um, low dimensional groups that are incoherent. And you can also see from this that a surface group doesn't algebraically fiber. Okay, so, and likewise in four dimensions, so we know that three dimensional groups fiber all the time, often have Euler characteristic zero. Okay, um, in four dimensions, you can do a similar thing. So a result of hillman Koklakova showed that if G is a fundamental group of an aspherical four manifold and K is finitely presented, then that implies that K is actually a PD3 group, so satisfies all the group theoretic properties of a three manifold group. In particular, this implies that um, the Euler characteristic is defined. So then again, if I have the Euler characteristic of, um, if I had a finitely presented kernel here, then the Euler characteristic of Z G would have to be zero. So for four manifolds, if I have an algebraic fibering, for a group that doesn't have Euler characteristic zero, then it must be incoherence. In particular, this kernel of the algebraic vibration is gonna be the witness to incoherence. So for a hyperbolic four manifold, fibering implies incoherence. And this has been a really good source of understanding incoherent four manifolds. And there's lots of examples now, lots of interesting examples of four manifolds that are incoherent. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about incoherent groups. So one thing, um, a lot of interesting groups are going to be incoherent. And also, it's sort of easier to show that a group is incoherent because you just have to find a witness to incoherence. You just have to find a um, subgroup that's finitely generated but not finitely presented. So probably the most famous example is F2 times F2, which I think is due to Stallings. At least he wrote it down in that Warbach key paper. Um, and what you can do is you can look at the kernel of the map to Z. So I have F2, A, B, generated by A, B, and S, T. And that just sends each generator to one. So this is a kernel of a fiber. Um, and it is, uh, you can show that this is a witness to incoherence in various ways. You can look at the um, second cohomology. You can look at the, um, you can see this kernel as a finitely generated group, finitely generated group amalgamated over an infinitely generated group. So I'll go over that. That's probably the most basic way to show it. I'll say that again in a minute. Um, and Bodich Mess, in a paper that I um, read and really learned a lot from, showed there's an incoherent hyperbolic four manifold using a very similar technique to what I just said. And Kapovich and Podiogayo. Um, used this technique also slightly earlier, showing that um, these four manifolds don't satisfy the L4's finiteness theorem. So they're really different from um, hyperbolic three manifolds. So let me just describe that, because it's uh, great, and it's also um, relevant to our proof. Okay, so 
if you have, um, this is what they started with. So this is supposed to depict a, um, a hyperbolic fiber three manifold. Here's the same one. So they found a hyperbolic fiber three manifold that has a totally geodesic surface contained in it. And a very specific one, so this is a very specific example. So they put one of the hyperbolic three manifolds in hyperbolic four space as like a totally geodesic subsurface. So like where the fourth coordinate is zero. And then they put the other purple hyperbolic three manifold perpendicular to that. And they glued them along this totally geodesic copy of H2 here because this surface subgroup is gonna stabilize that copy of H2. And this gave them a hyperbolic four manifold group. Now, since this group fibers here, um, I can look at the, um, the kernel of the map to Z is gonna intersect this surface group here in an infinitely generated group. Because remember, surface groups don't algebraically fiber if, unless they are four, right, of course. And same here. So the group that they took, the witness to incoherence, the subgroup, is a fiber on this side, union the fiber on that side, so that's definitely finitely generated. And it's amalgamated along the intersection with this surface subgroup, which is infinitely generated. So they had an infinite, finitely generated by finitely generated, amalgamated over an infinitely generated subgroup. So this, such a group will be finitely generated, but not finitely presented by a result of, result of Peter Neumann, and they outlined that proof in their, in their paper. So that's the trick. You take a fiber, which has bad geometry, another fiber which has bad geometry, and you glue them together. So the result is not a surface subgroup, but it's related to the geometry of those surfaces. All right, so what do we show? We show that if you have um, a group that is free by free, so I need to have n bigger than or equal to two here because free by cyclic groups are coherent or G is a surface by free group, or again, N has to be bigger than two because surface by Z groups are coherent, then G is incoherent. So note that whatever N is, F M by F2 will be a subgroup and S G by F2 will be a subgroup of this group. So, um, and if I show that any subgroup it is incoherent, then the group is incoherent because it'll contain the finitely generated but not finitely presented subgroup. So we really just need to concentrate on free by F2 and surface by F2. All right, so, so here's some, uh, let me just say a little bit about what we do here. Okay, so we say that a group has excessive homology if uh, a group by is, that's H by Fn has excessive homology if the rank of um, the cohomology is bigger than N. So this is gonna give us an extra map to Z. So if you remember when you were studying vibrations of hyperbolic three manifolds, you, would, um, you could look at the space of maps to Z and the, the vibrations are gonna be in there. So if you have um, the rank is higher, what you get is you get extra vibrations that's going to give you more vibrations and then you can do the same thing using the very normal stable invariance for free groups or in general other groups so um, we proved that if i have a group of the form free by free or surface by free which has excessive homology then it's incoherent and the basic idea is that the excessive homology is going to give you another map to z so i have this fiber three manifold and since i have excessive homology on the whole group i know that there's an extra map to Z that doesn't just come from uh, these two uh, vibrations. So that extra map to Z is gonna give me another fiber. And I also have that map restricted to this side, give me another fiber. If I make them small enough, it'll have finitely generated kernel. So I could do this with Barry Newman Strable, for example. And then when I add a little tiny bit of that fiber to this fiber, I get something that's gonna intersect this surface in the same as if I add a tiny little bit of fiber to this fiber. So what I get is I glue that new fiber on this side to the new fiber on this side, amalgamated along this. And again, you'll get a finitely generated subgroup amalgamated with another finitely generated subgroup along an infinitely generated subgroup. So it'll be incoherent. So um, another really important uh, property that we use is the reefers property. So uh, this was introduced 
by Ian Agle back in the day when he was studying vibrations of hyperbolic three manifolds. So we say that a group is reefers, which is residually finite rationally solvable. If there is a sequence of finite index, you can take them normal subgroups, G, which exhausts the group, this is important, and such that the kernel of the map to homology is going to be contained in our next successive group. Okay, so why is this um, a really strong property that's very useful? Is that if I have a G in some GI, but not in some GI plus one, which will happen because of this property, then that means G must be non-trivial in this homology because the kernel of the homology is contained in this successive uh, subgroup. So the um, so that means that every element is going to be non-trivial in homology in some finite sheet of cover, which is very strong. Okay, and there's a lot known about reefers now, which is really um, which we really use. So um, a lot of people have done work on this. So uh, let's look at this group. Let's just do FM by F2. Then we, we want to say if there exists some S in F2 such that this subgroup is reefers, then G is incoherent. So if there is a, such an S, we're going to take one side to be this, and then we'll just pick another side to be some T so that, um, so that we get an FM by F2 subgroup here. All right, so now the other side, so I have this T side, so I'm tr I tried to draw, I actually drew a surface by F2, sort of a cartoon of that, because um, it's easier to see. And the proof is similar. So if I have a, um, this other side, this free by T side is um, gonna be large. So it'll have a um, infinite index cover with excessive homology. Um, large means it has a um, finite index cover that surjects to F2. So sorry, it'll have a finite index cover with excessive homology. And um, so that'll, uh, this group here will lift to some finite index subgroup. And I can find a cover of this, so some power of this S that stabilizes that. So this finite index cover, I can take it to be of the form a surface by Z. And then I can find a cover over here that agrees with it. And then I'll get a cover that is, again, a surface by F2. Okay, but it'll be an infinite index cover because I just sort of pieced them together. It's not a finite index at that point. So then the other side, so now I have this element, because this is large, this element um, is non-trivial in homology. On the other side, by reefers, there's a finite index cover of that by this property up here of reefers, where this particular element is non-trivial in homology. So I do the same trick, again, passing to an infinite index cover that looks like a surface by F2. Uh, my surface might be a finite index cover of the surface. But in this case, my G now, my element of the surface group, is actually non-trivial on both sides. So that is going to imply by Meyer via Taurus that this has excessive homology. And then my previous theorem, if you have excessive homology, then that is incoherent. So in that infinite index subgroup, there's a witness to, to incoherence. So the whole group has a witness to incoherence. And then we do the same thing for a surface group of different results that we need to use. We use a lot of people's results. Fortunately, people have done great work, really great work with all this. And again, we're gonna get an infinite index subgroup with excessive homology. And so that means that infinite index subgroup will be incoherent, so the whole thing is incoherent. Okay, so that shows that if we have one side that's reefers, then the um, group is incoherent. But what if we don't? How can we reduce to this case? So suppose we have a subgroup H of out FM, then we know by Handel-Moser that H either contains some fully irreducible element which is, so suppose that's F, that's gonna imply that FM by that uh, Z generated by S is actually reefer, so then we're done. Or there's a finite index subgroup of H, which leaves a free factor invariant. So our free factor um, by induction will have to be uh, rank one, which means it'll just act by conjugation. So we can just quotient out by the normal closure of that to go down one dimension. So uh, we previously showed that if I have a, um, 
So I'm going to, uh, so we want to show this. So we previously showed that all F2 by Fm have virtually excessive homology. And this is because we understand ought F2 very well. And we can look at a specific finite index subgroup and show that that has virtually excessive homology. So we're going to induct on in. We have our Fm by F2 group. So we're going to quotient out by this, uh, by this um, rank one subgroup to get a Fm minus one by F2 subgroup. So either that has excessive homology when we're done, or um, we, we can keep doing it all the way down to F2 where we know it has excessive homology. Um, and in any case, we can pull back. Sometimes this might be an infinite index subgroup if one of these elements is refers to get an infinite index subgroup of G with excessive homology. All right. So similarly, uh, in the surface group case, we need to use even off a similar result to what I just mentioned, that if I have a subgroup of the mapping class group, then it either contains a pseudo NOSOP or there's a finite index subgroup that fixes a curve. So I can start cutting again and do induction. Okay, so this also allows us to, um, you know, free groups are um, really in a lot of groups. So if we have, uh, we can answer some other questions using this. So uh, Hillman had this really interesting question and or interesting work on um, fibered surfaces, surfaces over surfaces, like surface bundles over surface. Um, so he conjectured that the fundamental group G of an aspherical surface bundle over a surface is going to be coherent if and only if the Euler characteristic is zero. So if the Euler characteristic is not zero, then by the um, multiplicative Euler characteristic thing I was telling you about, that'll mean that both of these surfaces need to have negative Euler characteristic. So in particular, this group G will contain a surface by free group because SH will contain a free group. And so it's incoherent by our surface by free, our incoherent result above. Okay, so what if it doesn't contain, uh, what if its Euler characteristic is zero? So that would mean that either this subgroup or this subgroup would have to be uh, Z2. So if this subgroup is Z2, then Z2 has this wonderful property that every subgroup of it is finitely generated. So if I have a finitely generated subgroup here, it project to a finitely generated subgroup here. And this kernel will also be finitely uh, generated. And this will be finitely presented. And this will be finitely presented because both of these are coherent. So G will be coherent. Now, that was noticed by Hilmer. So if you have SH being um, a torus group, then you can use a result of Berman, Lebotsky, and McCarthy that says Z2 subgroups of out SG are reducible. So that means I can cut this along. I can cut my surface. This is just a very simple um, reduction where um, this each side is either like trivial or a pseudo and also if, 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 as I keep cutting. So if I look at my torus bundle over the surface, this side is going to be like a central extension of a three manifold. And here I'm going to have a torus bundle over the circle. So it'll be, a, um, kind of, this will be a separate fiber space in particular to fit into a, um, a short exact uh, sequence where the um, kernel and the quotient are both have the property that every subgroup is finitely uh, generated. So those will be coherent. And then I'll just glue my thing together. So I'll have this group where this side is coherent, these sides are coherent, is glued together along these really nice groups where every subgroup is finitely generated. So I have coherent, coherent, glued along, uh, this is supposed to be a little graph of groups here, a uh, subgroup where every subgroup is finitely generated. So this by a result of Keras and Solitar is going to be coherent. All right, uh, I'm almost out of time. I am out of time, so let me just say this really quick. So we'll get a general framework in general for a one-ended hyperbolic a coherent group when H is coherent, and Q some subgroup of the outer automorphism group of H. So I can look at the full preimage in G, and we can say that G is going to be coherent exactly when Q does not contain F2. So this uses a JSJ decomposition for groups. So H is hyperbolic, so it has a JSJ decomposition um, where it has the pieces that are hanging Fuchsian 
either, so these will have automorphism groups like a surface, so we can use our surface by free stuff. The rigid pieces would have finite automorphism group and the virtually cyclic pieces. And Levite um, shows that you can write uh, the subgroup of um, out H here as uh, you can look at just like partial conjugations on these pieces and also, and then it projects to the mapping class group of the, of the Fuchsian pieces. And so you can use that to piece together this group of automorphisms here, similarly to how I did before. Uh, okay, I will end with just a few questions. I wish I had time to say more about that. Uh, okay, so do free by free and surface by free groups virtually fiber? We actually don't know this because we construct um, infinite index subgroups that have excessive homology. We don't know if this happens in a finite index subgroup. We can show this for F2 by Fn because we understand ought F2. So there might be some more um, properties of ought Fm that show that we actually can't do this because it's not as, um, as nice. So another um, classic question is that I really love is, is coherence a quasi-isometry invariant? Uh, that's not known. Uh, a more tractable question might be local quasi-convexity. Uh, question that Wise asks in a, um, a really nice uh, um, survey on incoherence called, I think, uh, Introduction to Coherence, um, is if you have groups with Euler characteristic greater than zero, are those incoherent? He asks this in the two-dimensional case, I believe. So, but, but all the examples of um, groups with positive Euler characteristic are incoherent. And then also, there's been some work done um, by uh, Louder and Wilton and also Wise, showing that if you have a strong form of negative Euler characteristic, then you're actually coherent. So um, that's a very interesting uh, dichotomy there. Oh, and thank you.